We turn then this morning to Hebrews chapter 11 and verses 17 through 22. 17 through 22. As we continue on this exploration of what faith is, what it means to be the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is often dismissed as the opposite of intellect or things that can be proved. But one of the interesting things is that's not a biblical definition of faith. And in the verses we're going to consider now, we're going to look at the fact that real faith is tried and tested. Tried and tested. So that its character and nature is proven to be true and equips us to go through life. In those little brown testaments we gave out at the war weekend, I found a testimony toward the end. And this is what's written there. The name's not given, but it says, When your small testaments were distributed on the common at Southampton, I, among others, accepted one in a more derisive than a complimentary manner. I little deemed that I should use it and find in it great consolation in lonely hours. I have learned to realise the great personality of the Saviour. When at night I have been on duty alone with him by my side and the Germans but 30 yards away, I realised that I needed more than my own courage to stand the strain. When the shells of the enemy have burst periodically at my feet, I have marvelled at the fact of still being alive. That's faith. That's faith in the furnace. That's faith standing the test of time. And that's truly a picture of what you and I should expect as Christians. Believing on the Lord Jesus Christ is the beginning of a lifetime pilgrimage and experience of God. And there will be times in our life when we really are asking, is it real? Is it true? Is he there? Is he absent? And what you have then in Abraham, who's presented to us as a, an example of faith, often one of the greatest examples, is this awesome truth that faith is tested. And tested not to destroy it, but to strengthen it. I served my apprenticeship as a young tradesman. And one of the things we learned was how to make things out of iron, put it in the furnace and hammer it on the anvil. What was the purpose of all that? I've forgotten most of it, but I do remember this little bit. It actually made it stronger and better. You added things to it and it became a powerful tool and in some people's hands a weapon. When we read these passages before us today, I want you to take on board this great truth that believing on Jesus is not a free ticket to an easy life or to end up in heaven with no trouble. In actual fact, when you read history, believing in Jesus has brought more trouble to people's lives. But that's a whole other subject. Let me take you then to look at this passage under just two headings. The pattern in Abraham and then the examples of Isaac, Jacob and Joseph. And we'll see how God will teach us not to be surprised when trouble comes. And definitely to cast ourselves upon his mercy when we find these troubles puzzling beyond comprehension. Let's consider then the pattern in verses 17 through to 19. The pattern. The pattern that I see here is that faith means trusting God in all circumstances and especially when you can't see the reason for what's happening. And you're puzzled about how it will ever work out well. Abraham is presented to us here as a man who, under God's grace, had left his family and friends to go to a strange country and then saw some incredible events. I'll come back to them later. 
but was promised the Son. And then all of God's promises are focused in that Son. And then God says, I want him to die. Just let it sink in. That's what really struck me about this passage. And I believe that's why it's been put in the chapter. Everything hinges on Isaac. And God says, take him and kill him. I can just imagine Abraham scratching his head. Why? How is this going to work? And I want to put it to you. That if you're a Christian, there are going to be times when you're absolutely baffled about how on earth this is ever going to work and come to a good conclusion. I can't help but think about this little chapel. Is it three or four years ago? I do need to tidy up that in my mind. I think it's three, isn't it? Somebody will tell me it's four. But we were given this and of course we entered here trusting God and he proved himself to us in providing all we needed. And the seats are still not full. You remember when we were all so expectant? The real test is, you see, can you have that kind of faith? Which keeps going because it's the right thing to do, because God hasn't changed, because God's promises are fixed, sure, and better than money in the bank. There are going to be times when God asks us to walk in the dark. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. In the dark. One of life's most painful experiences is to see a loved one taken from us. Abraham is not only to expect to see his loved one taken, he's expected to be the agent by which he's taken. Profoundly heart searching. By faith, Abraham, when he was, notice that word, tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding, this is faith now working, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. <coughs> in which he also received him in a figurative sense. Abraham rejoiced to see my day, says Jesus, and was glad. John chapter 8. I find here quite a challenge, because we're all prone to want a smooth path and an easy life. It's built into us. You see, isn't it just something of the fact that we were designed to live in the Garden of Eden with God, not in a broken world with sin? We all long for those peaceful, happy days. And yet the reality is far from it. The Bible recognizes the world as a broken place. And the scriptures show and speak of the promise of the God who walks with us through life's storms. You probably have read the poem Footprints. It's based on a couple of verses from the book of Isaiah. Here's one of them. Isaiah 43 verse 2. When you pass through the waters. Wait a minute Lord. Where did it show me in the small print I was going to pass through waters? It's not in the small print. It's there bold and large. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, pardon, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. That's God's promise to those who believe in him. Isaiah 46 verse 4, even to your old age, oh thank you Lord, I am he, and even to grey hairs, I will you I have made and I will bear even I will carry and will deliver you you remember David's words I have been young and I've I'm now old and I've never seen the righteous forsaken boy he went through some rough times that's faith because the ultimate thing that matters is knowing God 
knowing that God's for you and knowing that God will bring you to a good conclusion. In the world, says my Saviour, you will have a great time. No, no, no. Not in any version. You will have tribulation. It's one thing to read it. It's entirely different to experience it. It is, though, a test. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested. That's a profoundly challenging thought. God gives me the gift of faith and I believe in Jesus as my saviour. I'm now a child of God. His Holy Spirit bears testimony with my spirit that I'm a child of God. Why do I need testing? Even the saviour was tested. One of the interesting things in the New Testament, the word that's translated tested here is the same word that's translated as tempted. A very subtle difference in it. You see, what's happening in temptation is when Satan comes and he wants you to throw in the towel and abandon God and to effectively sin. The same experience is used by God to strengthen us, develop us, and to equip us to move on. And with every challenge in life, you've got those two alternatives. Well, I go with Satan the liar who said at the beginning, has God really said? Notice the emphasis on the word. Or will I go with my gut? The apple looks good, sorry, I should say the fruit looks good. And I'm hungry. Munch. So everywhere throughout life, we are coming up against tests. And the good news is, earlier on in Hebrews, it tells us that Jesus was tempted in all ways, even as we are. So we have a Savior who's been right to the front line, faced the bullets, felt the bombs, and has triumphed victoriously. God tests us. James, sorry, Peter Chapter 1 talks about the glory of the... First Peter chapter 1 talks about the glory of God's work for us. And then he, he throws in the bombshell, doesn't it? We've got all these benefits from God, but our faith will be tested. As by fire. So that it will be purified. It will be proved to us. And go back to verse 1. Faith is the substance of things not seen the evidence of things hoped for I think I've muddled them up a wee bit but you know where I'm coming from it becomes a visible way of life a mental attitude and a powerful strength like the tartan pimpernel not just to look after your own skin but to stay where God has put you that you might be used for his glory by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. I've got written here, faith is complete confidence in God in the face of the impossible. In the face of the impossible. Faith, I've further written, is the result of that hearing and believing which proves that God is faithful. It came up as I read it way back in verse 11. How did, how did Sarah manage to conceive a child? Because she trusted God who is faithful. Now when faithful is used, it's always with regard to God's trustworthiness in relationship to what he said. And our faith responds to who we know. He loved me, gave himself for me. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by, what's that five letter word? It's not some nebulous non-entity, those are interesting words, but a real powerful force which transforms us. We're saved by faith, and then we are to live by faith. There's Abraham. 
this great champion of the Bible. As I read this, I thought, this really makes sense of the imaginary conflict between James and Paul, doesn't it? In, in Paul's letter to the Romans, he talks about Abraham being saved by faith without works. And then James has these words. It says, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. And he goes on to say that faith without works is dead. And it's a, a conundrum that has puzzled Christians down the centuries. Are the books contradicting each other? No, they're, they're looking at the same thing from a different angle. When we come to Christ as a sinner condemned and trust him to be our saviour, there is a legal change that takes place. We are justified by faith, declared righteous. But the faith which justifies is a faith which goes on to express itself in works. And that's where James is coming from. He's talking to people who are already Christians. Paul's talking to folks who's not sure are Christians. So when James is writing, he's saying to his audience, listen folks, if you've really just trusted Jesus, it'll show. Abraham. His faith showed. At the age of 75, Abraham enrolled in the school of faith, says Warren Wearsby. Now he was over 100 and he was still having soul-stretching experiences. We are never too old to face new challenges, fight new battles and learn new truths. When we stop learning, we stop growing and when we stop growing, we stop living. Now, in no sense is this saying you've not to feel the pain. You will feel the pain. You're human. But you should also know the power. In this you greatly rejoice. And you had it written here somewhere. Though now for a little while, if need be. I like that little phrase. First Peter chapter 1 verse 6. If need be, you have been grieved by various trials that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire may be found to praise, honour and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. James chapter 1 verse 3 says the testing of your faith produces patience. In the now generation, when we click our fingers and imagine we can have whatever we want, this kind of thinking is, is, is really counterintuitive, isn't it? It goes against the flow. But I'd rather be guided by the God who's faithful than by the world that is always fickle, passing. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son of whom it was said, and Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding. Notice that intellectual matter. Some people talk about faith and it's almost like electricity. You know, you've got to charge yourself up like a battery. And then you can shock the world by the way you live. Nonsense. Faith is trust in God. Forsaking all things, I trust him. That's how they used to define faith. Forsaking all things, I trust him. Oh, my dear friend, it's a battle. It must have been for, for Abraham. But he concludes that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. He knew the God who had promised. He had known previous testings. The day he was called to leave out of the Chaldees and move hundreds of miles from family and friend. The day that there was no food in the land and he had to go down to Egypt to get food. The day when there was a fight to go on and he had to go and rescue Lot, remember? The day that he was offered all the treasure that had been taken from the enemy and he refused it rather trusting God. The day when those angels said, you're going to have a boy. 
And in him all the promises are going to... You can see Abraham's faith wobble a wee bit, don't you? Because his wife says, I'm too old. And, and so you get Hagar involved. And Ishmael's born. Abraham's faith is not a straight line. We could go back and see how he, he, he lied to Abimelech and various other things. It's a, an up and down but a forward going journey. And here he comes to the ultimate test. The ultimate test is this. Having to make the choice between the God who loves me and the things that I love. You mums here have a unique link to your children, don't you? No matter how old they get, they're still your kids. And you can talk to them in a way that nobody else can. It also exists between a father and a son. And here's a father being asked to decide who he loves most. The God who loves him or the son that God has given him. And I couldn't help but thinking, you see, that's, that's the real test of faith, isn't it? Who do I love first and foremost? Often the battle is just between whether you love yourself. It's my life, they tell me. I'll make my choices. I'll go where and when I want. Foolishly, I've said it. Thank God that he's kept me in the way of faith. Poor, poor Abraham. My heart goes out to him as I read this account. Notice the emphasis. He says, his only begotten son. Now that's an interesting parallel to John 3.16. Some people read John 3.16 and say, Jesus then was born from God. He, he, he had a physical start and they ignore the fact that only begotten is a technical term for the one who is the heir of the family the one in whom the promises are contained and here Isaac is described as his only begotten I've already mentioned Ishmael haven't I and wasn't there another child with Keturah this is his special son this is the one in whom Abraham not only finds delight as a human father, this is the one in whom Abraham finds, deal, finds hope for the future. Because it's in him that all the nations are going to be blessed. It's through him that Jesus is coming. Cut off Isaac and the whole gospel goes down the plot hole. And it reminds us there of whom it was said in Isaac, your seed shall be called. How is it possible, Abraham, to deal with it like this? Trust God. Believe that God will do the impossible. They took the body down from the tree, didn't they? That's got rid of that troublemaker. Well, did they know? Three days later, he would be alive. And through him, a new movement began which has turned the world upside down. Saved people from every tribe and tongue and nation. As I said, no Isaac, no Jesus. So stand with Abraham. Feel the challenge that was here. And understand why he said that, or it says that he concluded, that he reasoned in his mind because of what he knew about God. Some things we have to talk to ourselves. Do you ever talk to yourself? Yeah. Do you have a good conversation? They tell me the problem is when you answer yourself back. <laughs> but we do need to talk to ourselves. We need to set our minds on things above. We need to say to ourselves at times, I know how I feel, I can see what's happening, but I know where God is. And he's not shifted one little bit. He's the same today, yesterday, and forever. And that's the challenge I see here. 
He chose to believe God. That's faith. And he set a pattern before us. So that we can know when our faith is working. When we choose to keep on following Jesus, it is your choice. If the Holy Spirit's given you a new heart, God is at work in you both to, I like this one, will and to do. He gives you the want to. And it's that want to which makes you start over again, time after time, as you come to him in prayer and repentance, and you stand up like you've had a new beginning. And you keep going forward. Oh dear friends, let this, let this challenge us. about our lifestyle. Be honest, we, we, we are inclined to want the bird in the hand rather than the two in the bush. In fact, it's a popular proverb of great wisdom. But sometimes God says, no, trust me for the two in the bush. Step out with me and see that you will indeed do exploits and be used under God. Can you get your head around the fact that the, the, the lead pilot in the bombing of Pearl Harbor was converted and became a missionary to the Japanese? That's just plain daft crazy. Not in God's book. How would you have handled Abraham's test? In each of your life, there are areas where that same test is going on. You've been asked day after day to keep believing, keep trusting. And you're being asked to do that on the basis of what you know God did for you in Christ. And what he's promising to do for you for the rest of your days. We are indebted to the many who fell on the battlefields of France and Belgium and other places. Winston Churchill stood in the House of Commons on August the 20th, 1940. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. And we do need to remember we owe, we owe those families a great debt. I have an uncle with a name on a cenotaph in Liberton in Edinburgh. And on Cath's Uncle was killed in Tripoli. We owe our freedom to them. And thank God for a nation where that kind of mentality worked. But let's go back and say, while I would never demean what they've done, it's, it's, it's small in comparison to what God has done in Christ. And if God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, then there's nothing more reasonable than my putting faith in him, trusting him for the days that lie ahead. Otherwise, you're telling God you tell lies. And if I were to say to you, face to face, you were a liar, you would get most indignant, wouldn't you? Can you see then why God is entitled to be indignant with unbelievers? The good news is the gospel contains the grace of forgiveness and the power of transformed lives. As I was kicking the idea around and trying to find a, 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 a way of explaining this for unbelievers, you know that 306 men were shot for desertion in the First World War? 306? One heartbreaking account was of a young boy of 16 who lied and told the, the army that he was 18 so he could join up. And then when he deserted, he was brought back, court-martialed and tried and shot. Still not old enough to join the army. It's profound, isn't it? And our hearts go out. The information's available because there's a movement on to get these people a pardon. And that can happen in time, can't it? But for the unbeliever, we have to say this is the only time for a pardon. Jesus died for sinners. And if you're a sinner, 
Get hold of him. Trust him. Join us. I realise this would take up most of the time I had this morning. And for that reason, I just want to run through the next few verses as examples and show you that this, this, this pattern of trusting God is a pattern which is to be at the heart of all our lives. And it has been at the heart of every true believer's lives. Every true believer has wrestled with the testing of God. If you want, I could almost argue that it's a mark of being a true believer. There are three important examples here for us that show us there's no promise of an easy journey. There's no promise of an easy way through this. Romans chapter 15 verse 4 it says, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patient and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. We look back into these narratives in the Old Testament and it would take us a few weeks to go through every one of their stories and tease out every bit of their life. But I think the way they've been laid down here is quite deliberate. Because, let me get the order right, Isaac, Jacob and Joseph here are all being spoken about at the end of their lives. You see it says, by faith Jacob when he was dying, by faith Joseph when he was dying. It's missing from Isaac, but if you go back and read the account, Isaac thought he was dying and therefore blessed his children. He did manage to live another 40 years, but he was actually at the end of a life of experience of walking by faith. And as such, their encouragement and an incentive to go on. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning the things to come. How much time would it take to tell that whole story? Jacob and Esau, you remember? His two boys, twins. Isaac thought he was dying and he tells Esau to go and make that special food that he loved and to bring it to him. His mother's listening, Rebecca, isn't it? His mother's listening and she knows that when the boys were born, the promise was given to, 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 to Jacob and not to Isaac. So like every good mother, she manages the situation. Cooks the special food, dresses her boy up, fools the old man whose eyesight is failing. And Isaac then gives a blessing to Jacob. Genesis 28, 3 to 4. Listen, because the words are very familiar. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may be an assembly of peoples and give you the blessing of Abraham, to which you and your descendants with you, that you may inherit the land in which you are a stranger, which God gave to Abraham. Isaac is looking forward to the future, although he's physically blind and he himself is dying. We could spend a long time going through his troubles, but we won't. There's some Sunday afternoon homework for you. At the end of the day, he's known God in his life and he wants to make sure that that knowledge of God is passed on. That's why there are Christians like you and I today. Our forefathers held such views, didn't they? They were absolutely convinced that this gospel was for the nation and for the people and it must continue. And, and, and as I read this and as I think now, you see that there's something here for us. Faith is not simply a personal, private belief. It's a, a, a very public, powerful belief and it's involved in taking the gospel. I met a man from Holland yesterday. You're wasting your time talking to me, he says. I'm an atheist. They did have some language barriers. But he was determined to stay an atheist. It's incredible, isn't it? How anybody with their head on the right way can be an atheist. They're still to me a real atheist. They don't exist. 
That's something to think about. But I'll bite my tongue. Isaac stands before you then as an example. Jacob on his deathbed. You remember the story? What a life that man lived. He had to go off to get a wife. And then when he got there, his, his uncle Laban turned out to be a first class rogue. He had twisted Esau's arm or be, defeated him and gone off and he eventually comes back. God has blessed him. He meets God at Bethel. God gives him the blessing. God himself reveals himself to him so that he has a personal faith. And when, when he's dying, he wants to make sure that the next generation have the same faith. Genesis 28, 13, and behold, Sorry, that's Isaac getting his blessing. No, that's Jacob getting his blessing. And behold, the Lord stood above it. This is the rock at Bethel. And said, I am the Lord God of your father, Abraham, and the God of Isaac, the land in which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. And your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and the east, to the north and the south. And in you, and in your seed, that's Jesus, all the families of the earth, will be blessed. Behold, I am with you and I will keep you wherever you go and I will bring you back to this land. So when he's dying, he blesses Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. He crosses his hands and Joseph tries to uncross them and he says, no, this is the right order. This is how God has planned. He knows God. And he says to young Joseph, I know my son, I know. He also shall become a, a people, and he also shall be great, but truly his younger brother shall be greater than he. His descendants shall become a multitude of nations. What's happening? They're, 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 they know God for themselves. They're trusting that God is faithful and they're leaning on his word. And then Joseph, when he comes to that day when he must pass from this world to the next, Oh, we could have a good time going through Joseph's life, couldn't we? People have written whole books on the, the life of Joseph. That young upstart, daddy's favourite boy, who's got the special coat, who goes down and tells his brothers that one day the whole family's going to bow down before him. We're not having that. Excuse my paraphrase. Here's some Midian traders come. Let's sell him as a slave. Down he goes to Egypt. I need to resist because there's so many good bits in that story. Have a read for yourself. Genesis 37. Following. What a life before he finally becomes the one before whom his brothers will bow down. They didn't even recognize him, did they? Back with his father Jacob. Genesis 50, verse 24, Joseph said to his brothers, I am dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to the land which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph took an oath from the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. He knew the promise and what it meant. And he was looking for it. Exodus 13, 19. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. For he had placed the children of Israel under solemn oath. Saying, God will surely visit you and you shall carry up my bones from here with you. Now I know I've skipped over vast areas of the book of Genesis. And that's quite deliberate. Because these three men stand as those who, like their father, grandfather, and great-grandfather, were tested. And how do we know the past the test? Because at the end of their days, their focus was still on who God had promised. Notice I said who, not what. Who? Jesus. Living by faith has always meant being tested. And if God should choose to test you this week, you might go out. You might say, I don't like this. But I can say, I don't want to be presumptuous, I can say surely with, the, with the, the whole weight of scripture behind me, if you trust God, it will do you good. 
you walk with God, it will do you good. And that's so much more important today. We're living in a day when the secular mind is running rampant. They've pushed into every part of society and now you Christians really are weird. That doctor just a couple of weeks ago sacked because he wouldn't call a man a woman. Have you ever heard the like? And it's only one of a great number of stories that are now coming out in public. The secular mind wants to indoctrinate everybody to think like itself. And as Christians, we, we just can't go with them. We love them. They're not our enemies. We need to trust God. Take our stand in the old paths. Follow him. Martin Luther writes, Faith unites the soul to Christ as a wife to her husband. All that Christ has becomes the property of the believing soul. All that the soul has becomes the property of Christ. Thus, by means of faith, the soul is delivered from every sin and clothed with the eternal righteousness of our husband, Jesus Christ. Bless union. That's faith. I am his and he is mine forever. Now you will find times when your awareness of that wavers. That, dear friends, is an alarm bell and a call back. Not a reason for running away. But even if you run. Psalm 37 and 24. Though you fall, you shall not fall headlong. For the Lord upholds you with his hand. If you're his. My dear friends, I hope I've shown you enough of what it means to see faith tried and tested. My final comment was a man who really talked to me in the marketplace yesterday called Keith. Turned out to be the exact same age as me. Didn't want to talk, but when he started I couldn't get him to stop. When I get a conversation like that, I look for opportunities and will insert the gospel time after time. But his armour was thick. And he wasn't having this. His first comment to me, I'm the kind of person that likes to be able to see and test what I'm using and living amongst. It's okay if people want to have faith, you know, casting it out. No, dear friends, I'm unashamedly, can I say proud in this kind of context? Proud to say, I made it very clear to him, faith is not just the alternative to death. Faith is as real as the air we breathe, as the world we live in, and it's fixed on the God who made it. Amen.